بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. Can you tell me about the the Lion King? I love his I love his nickname. <laughs> Sinjata. Sinjata, uh, he was the founder of the Mali Empire, and he was Muslim, and um, he gathered together. It's a long story, but basically, Sunjata was the prince of the Mali kingdom. It was a kingdom at the time, and he was the son of his father's third wife, but that was the wife that they said, there were two hunters that brought her and said that she was going to be the one that was going to deliver the person, that would deliver the son that was going to become the king after him. Uh, and so in his youth, he couldn't walk. Whoa, and hold on. That's, that's really mystical. So yeah, two yeah. hunters it's, came. It's a very mystical story. If you read the actual story, it's like a very mystical story. Um, but basically, yeah, there were these two hunters. And hunters in West African society were known for their because, you know, they're always in the forest. And the forest is where all the jinn live and all the spirits live and all of these kind of... So hunters, traditionally in West African society, are people who have closer contact with the spirit world than people who live in the cities or the towns. So these hunters, they brought this lady and people had already told him that the wife that is going to give birth to his successor hasn't arrived yet. And the hunters brought this lady to marry him and she became his wife. Um, And so when... When when she gave birth to her son Sunjata, he was named Marijata, which means like the, the 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 lion prince or the lion, the young lion, and um, he couldn't walk, and so the other wives would make fun of that wife because her son couldn't walk, and they would bully him, etc. Until one day, you know, he overcame. When he was in, he was about seven or eight. He managed to get like some crutches made, and he started to teach himself how to walk. And he was known for his strength. He was known for his ability to fight. He was known for his bravery. And when his father died, his oldest brother exiled him and his mother um, and attempted to kill them. So they went to Gao, which was a Muslim kingdom, like a real Muslim kingdom. And they lived there. And then somebody else came and took over the territories of the Mali Empire. And this story actually brings me into something else that I want to discuss in terms of my next book. But the person that took over the kingdom of Mali Empire was a blacksmith and his name was Sumaru Kunate. And what's interesting about the oral historians, when they talk about him, they said that he had so much, so they describe him as a magician and someone that had magic powers, but they described the fact that he was a metal worker. And so they said the capital city that he built, it had walls that were made of metal. And it had buildings and towers that were reinforced with metal. And that's a time when people were living in houses reinforced by wood and stone and mud. And the tower that he lived was a tower that had like maybe seven or eight stories. And it was made of metal. And this is in the 1200s. And I'll tell you why this is important. But remember that I said that I'll come back to the story after. But essentially, Sunjata gathered an army he traveled through west africa and he united 12 different kingdoms to form a coalition to defeat this king sumaru kunate because he was an evil king he would kill people he would sacrifice people and he'd do all kind of crazy stuff and so they ended up defeating him they burnt his city to the ground and then sunjata was established himself as the emperor of the mali empire he united the 12 kingdoms and um his general, his right-hand man, was his younger brother, Mandingbori Keita. And Mandingbori Keita ended up becoming the king. He didn't become the king after him, but his sons became the king after him. And then Mandingbori's grandson was Mansa Musa, the famous Mansa Musa. What's interesting about uh, Sunjata's story as well is that he, he established what was one of the first charters of human rights when he established the Mali Empire. Because he set about, and this was called the Manden Charter, and it was um, registered by UNESCO as one of the uh, World Heritage, you know, the things, of World Heritage, Human History and World Heritage. That was one of the first charters of human rights because it gave everyone the right to freedom, the right to religious freedom, the right to not be enslaved, and all of these things were established in the, in the charter that established the Mali Empire. What's interesting about this Sumaru Konate story is that when I went to Cornell University, which is an Ivy League university, I was speaking with a professor about this story. 
and he pointed out that when people say Sumari Kunate had such a mastery of metal that he was able to build towers and seven-story buildings, etc., that shows that if he hadn't been defeated, maybe Africa could have been on their way to have an industrial revolution the same time as Europe or even before Europe. Because when he was defeated, the artisan caste, who were the people who actually make things and produce boats, etc., were subjugated, and then the trading caste were placed on top of them. So if the traders rule the society, they don't care about production or producing things, they care about buying and selling things. Whereas if Sumaya Kunate had continued in that trajectory to the point that he had the technology to build story buildings with reinforced metal, that's equivalent to like, what we see today being built in terms of skyscrapers or multi-story buildings. Maybe if he had been allowed to continue or his cast of people who were the metal workers had been placed in a more senior position, then the history of Africa would have changed. So it's interesting to see all of these. And I talk about this in one of my forthcoming books. One of my forthcoming books I'm talking about um, Islam and the makings of the modern world and how different Muslim kingdoms and Muslim empires have affected the history of the world and produced the world that we live in today. Because there's so many aspects of history and society and culture and modern day society that we don't realize stem from Islam, either indirectly or indirectly. Is, so is is that the part that you said to ask you about later? Did you already yeah, address it right part. there? Yeah, that's the part. Don't ask me about it later, so we're there now. <laughs> Yeah, so they were just building seven-story metal towers, basically skyscrapers back then? Yeah, exactly. What year was this? This was in the 1200s. 1200s. I love that what the charter said. So this, in your book, I got to open right now. It says yeah. the charter contained a preamble of seven chapters uh, advocating social peace and diversity, the inviolability of the human being, education, the integrity of the motherland, food security, the abolition of slavery, and freedom of expression and trade. Mm -hmm. I was like, this sounds very modern. Yes, it sounds very modern. So it's interesting for many of us, because we've been disconnected from our history, we don't realize that many of the things that we think are progressive and are part of modern society and are modern inventions were things that our ancestors had been doing and been saying and been, you know, writing books about. But because we're disconnected from that history and that legacy and we haven't been taught to explore it and we haven't been taught to, uh, uh, to appreciate it, we don't know and we don't realize and we don't understand. So in my new book, I speak about that. I speak about, for example, the impact that Muslim scholars had in creating the environment that brought about the European Renaissance. The fact that today, for example, the numbers that we use today, one, two, three, four, five, that are the basis of modern science and technology, are called Arabic numerals. And the Europeans learned them from the Muslims. Because before that, they were using Roman numerals. And you can't use Roman numerals X and V and I to form the coding and the computers and the technology and the things that we have today. So even us being able to do this podcast, and I'm in Egypt and you're in America, and we have this technology, this is all due to coding, which is due to numbers, which the Europeans learned from the Muslims. So this is a barakah from the barakat of the Quran. This is a barakah from the barakat of the Prophet Wasallam. But we never look at it or see things that way. The fact that the oldest university in the world was established by a North African, Arab, Muslim woman. So many different things I'm going to cover in this, in this new book um, to show how intertwined all of our histories are and to show how there's so many aspects of history that have been hidden from mainstream retelling of stories. So even, for example, when you study European history, they talk about the Greeks and the Romans. And then it's like they skip the Dark Ages and the Middle Ages and then they end up in the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution and the Age of Empire and the Age of Exploration and the Age of Exploitation. But in between that, the knowledge of the Greeks and the Romans were lost to the Europeans. And it was the Muslims that had inherited that, translated it from Greek and Roman into Arabic. And then from Arabic, it was retranslated into Latin for the Europeans to be able to have access to the legacy of their ancestors and produce this revolution. Even 
the defeat of Constantinople, which was the capital of the Roman Empire, which then became Istanbul, the capital of Turkey. That is part of the history that kind of makes the environment that led to the European Renaissance, because the scholars that existed in the Roman Empire at the time, under, under close to Muslim rule, when the Ottomans took over, then they migrated into Europe and they took the knowledge that they had been learning through from their Muslim neighbors into Europe with them and helped them develop and produce the environment that produces the Renaissance. And then, yeah, there's so many things that it's an interesting tapestry of history that, um, yeah, I've written the new book and I'm just editing it at the moment. But when it's out, inshallah, I think it will open a lot of doors in people's minds to things that they didn't realize were connected before did you see that neil degrassi tyson video where he was talking about how i believe like one fifth of the stars in the universe are named arabic names because most of the stars discovered in the universe are by arabs or at least under the muslim yeah 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 i saw that yeah yeah man that's incredible so you weren't always a muslim which shocked me i thought Mm. you were born and raised muslim i didn't know you converted to islam this is the ansari podcast 